My name is Glenn Lockwood. I work at the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, otherwise known as NERSC, uh, along with Quincy. And now for something completely different. So throughout the morning and the first half of the afternoon, we've been talking about the part of parallel I.O. that you have the most control over. So this is embodied in this, the green parts of this stack that I've got up here. And this is the same stack that uh, Phil and Rob and, and Quincy, I think, all showed. And uh, so, so we've covered the parts you know, at the higher level of the stack because that's the things that you have control over and you and your applications can potentially uh, get right or wrong. Um, but there's also bits and pieces of the I.O. stack much lower that are sort of outside of your vision uh, that you still have to worry about, sadly, uh, even though you don't have control over them. And that's really the hardware and the system level components of uh, your I.O. subsystem on your typical HPC system. And although, um, you know, I'd love to talk about hardware, I could do it all day. Uh, in the context of performance, it's important to understand what's happening under the hood because uh, despite your best efforts, it's often the case that your performance is not limited by what your application is doing, but, what's by, but instead but what's happening underneath the hood and all of the subtleties and, and architectural differences between storage systems uh, that bubble up to the surface. So although, as Phil said this morning, um, systems can look very different, but the APIs you use should be the same. You should be using HDF5 or PNET CDF or something like that. Um, the reality is that you still often have to be aware of, of these subtle differences in architecture and hardware and how things are plumbed together um, so that you know what pitfalls inherent in the storage system that you're using uh, to avoid. So um, we've seen a few different versions of this diagram floated up here during the day, but this is kind of what every I.O. subsystem in a large-scale supercomputer looks like. Um, and this figure really hasn't changed a whole lot over the last decade or two. Um, so everything that we've talked about so far this morning has focused on uh, what's on the left here in these green blobs. These are your compute nodes. So when you run a job, this is what you request, and this is what you get, and this is where your jobs are launched, and all your computations happen. Now, when you're doing I.O., whether it be through HDF5 or MPIO or POSIX, if you enjoy pain, what's really happening is that that data, you, you issue a write call, it goes up into the OS kernel on your compute node, and then magic happens. It, it gets handled uh, on your behalf by the giant storage stack underneath the hood. So what happens in practice is that your I.O. usually lands on the, high, the, the network that your MPI traffic uh, also runs over, and then it exits this high-speed network, whether it be the BlueGene network or Cray Ares or InfiniBand, uh, and it transits to a new network, the I.O. fabric. And it does that through these I.O. nodes, and their job is really to um, turn packets of one protocol into packets of another protocol so that they can be delivered to storage nodes that contain storage media on the back end. Um, so a couple examples of this might be CIOD, which is what BlueGene uses. Uh, Cray systems have something called DVS. Uh, just about any large-scale Lustre file system that's architected this way uses LNet routers. So if you've heard any of these, those are generically known as I.O. nodes. So your I.O. traffic transits these I.O. nodes and leaves the compute fabric that your MPI traffic is also uh, running across, and then it transits to storage nodes. Um, these are servers that have media attached to them. Um, and these in the Lustre world would be known as object storage servers and metadata servers. If you've heard OSS or MDS in reference to Lustre, that's what these are. Uh, in the GPFS world, you have things called NSD servers. Um, they also fit the same bill of being the storage node. So this is where your, your data lives. Um, and these servers, their job is to also handle a lot of mounting permissions and things like that that prevent other users from messing with your data. Um, and their job, in large part, is to, again, turn one protocol. This will be something like uh, either a file system-specific protocol that your compute nodes kernels are talking, or a block-level protocol, um, if it's a certain type of parallel file system like GPFS, and turn that into yet another protocol that the storage devices themselves understand, so that your data is then, again, stored directly to storage arrays, uh, which are these gray cylinders at the bottom here. And those are actually the durable things, usually composed of flash or hard drives, or, or um, that's really it nowadays, or flash or hard drives, um, that reliably store your data. And it does this by taking a whole bunch of disks and applying parity, striping your data, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and what it does is essentially presents itself to the storage servers as one giant hard drive or one giant SSD that essentially never fails. And it's often the case that these storage nodes are paired up, as shown here. 
so that if one storage node fails, its partner can take over the half of the uh, block devices, the RAID arrays that its dead partner now owns so that you can still access your data even though the server that's supposed to be serving that data to you uh, is you know, down or crashed or has blown a capacitor or something like that. So I've, I've put up a few examples. Uh, maybe some of these acronyms look familiar, maybe they don't. Uh, it's not terribly relevant. I just wanted to put this picture up here so we're all speaking the same language um, and you can perhaps contextualize what I'm going to talk about with what you know and how you understand the storage systems that you've used. So let's talk about parallel file systems. And this is a picture that I took at NERSC. So if any, are any of you NERSC users? I would hope some of you are. So you probably all have accounts on Cori, perhaps have used and cursed the C Scratch file system. That's what this thing is. So this is C Scratch. Um, if you come visit us at NERSC, I'll take you down there and show you. This is what a 30 petabyte file system looks like in practice. Every one of these blue lights is a pair of Lustre OSSs. And if you pull, there's actually two, two blue lights per pair. And if you pull out one of those blue lights, it's a tray that has 41 hard drives in it. So if you count up the number of, of blue lights per rack and the number of racks, and then assume there's 41 hard drives behind each one, you can calculate how much disk capacity is behind this file system. And again, I put this picture up here to demonstrate the scale at which you know, uh, these storage systems that we're talking about actually operate and how they look and, and it might give you a better appreciation for why they sometimes don't always work the way you would like them to. So um, many of the speakers this morning have already talked about in principle what a parallel file system is. So to you as a user, you have one big file on this parallel file system and you access it as a single file. Um, but we know that under the hood, that file is actually represented in the form of chunks. And these chunks are almost always of a fixed size. Um, so the vast majority of Lustre and GPFS file systems out there use some kind of multiple of one megabyte. This is not strictly true. Uh, there's versions of Lustre that have progressive file layout, so you have variable striping. Um, but for all intents and purposes in this discussion, we can assume that you know, your file is broken up into one megabyte or some larger multiple of that stripes. And then so the client the, that lives on your compute nodes that actually takes what your application reads and writes and then turns those into network packets then then go to the Lustre or GPFS servers, see your big file as a collection of these chunks, and then it knows how to send these chunks to the servers on the storage fabric that own these chunks. And this is the basis for parallel I.O. And you know, as we've discussed this morning, this has great performance benefits, as you can imagine. So instead of one of your compute nodes talking to just one server to access the contents of your data, it can talk to many. Uh, servers and utilize the bandwidth and the performance of the CPUs and the network interfaces and the hard drives attached to many servers rather than one, giving you net better performance than if you were talking to a single server. As you scale up, you might have multiple compute nodes in your jobs, and these can talk to multiple servers at the same time, so you can access larger data sets without having to swap things in and out and shuffle them in the MPI space. You just read them all directly in parallel, and then as you continue scaling, um, you can assign you know, multiple compute nodes talking to uh, a subset of servers, and they're all doing this in a very coordinated fashion so that you're minimizing the number of bottlenecks in the system. Everything is nicely balanced, and this is precisely what MPIO and all of the things built on top of it strive to do on your behalf. So if you choose not to do MPIO or HDF5 or PNET CDF, this is something that you have to figure out on your own. And you have to understand the nuances of how your file system is actually physically arranging all the bits in your files. So we've talked about Lustre. And um, I would imagine most of you have heard of Lustre in the past. I certainly did as a graduate student. Uh, by the way, I'm not a computer scientist. I came from the material science world. So in a sense, I'm a, a, fallen, computer sci or a fallen material scientist. So I, I came into this really kind of just hearing the language of the systems that I'm using and people complaining about things like that. And uh, what led me to this field is understanding, you know, what's everyone complaining about? So that's the perspective that I bring to you. I will explain, I'll do my best to explain, you know, what, what everyone's complaining about and why it's not so bad and why things are the way they are. Um, so some key features about Lustre, as many of you may know, is that it has this notion of metadata. So this is the file names, how they're arranged in directories, what their permissions are, and things like that. And then it has data, which is the contents of those files. And Lustre characteristically separates those two things. So the contents of your files live on object storage servers, which are these uh, salmon colored blocks here. And then each object storage server has one or more object storage targets, which are these big RAID uh, devices, um, 
often called LUNs, Luster calls them OSTs. Um, so your data lives on OSTs that are served up by OSSs, and your metadata lives on MDTs, metadata targets, which are served up by metadata servers. Um, and Luster, one of its key defining features in addition to that is that it lets you as the user define the striping of your files. So it is up to you to decide if you want to store one megabyte chunks on each of the OSTs or if you want to store 32 megabyte chunks on each one of these OSTs. You can go smaller. You can do down to, I think, a 32 kilobyte stripe if you want. The performance will be terrible, but you could do that if, the, if you felt that there was a very strong reason to do that. Um, and these are the commands. I put them up here on how to actually control the striping of your file. So get stripe tells you what the stripe layout of your file is. Set stripe is what you use to say, um, I want the striping of all files created in this directory, directory to be as described. So this doesn't change the striping of an existing file. Yes? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just curious, um, because before, you, when you showed us the picture, you said like these are all Luster OSSs. Yep. Um, so I was wondering, like, in a hardware sense, are the OSSs and the MDSs different, or is it just like basically the program that they're running? They're designed a little differently. Um, just because, so OSTs are meant for bandwidth, and that's actually the next bullet point here, which is a great segue. Um, so Luster in general is designed for performance first, and it was really designed as a file system to be able to absorb very large IOs that are nicely laid out very quickly. Um, so they're designed in such a way, and their parity and their hardware configuration is such as they can take in large sequential pieces of IO. And the metadata servers are slightly different. Um, if you think about the way you typically access files, say you log into your Luster file system, you do an LS and you see a whole bunch of files. And the metadata that encodes those file names is most likely scattered all over a bunch of different drives. They're not nice and sequentially ordered. So you would design a, a Luster metadata server slightly differently so that it's optimized for random access rather than streaming access, which is what Luster is is really designed to do. So that, as a result, um, metadata rates are, are pretty poor on Luster. That's just you know the nature of its, its heritage. It's not designed to do metadata. It's not to, designed to do small IOs. It's meant to give as much bandwidth as, as humanly possible to very large checkpointing style jobs or workloads. So the other major parallel file system implementation that you will probably encounter is uh, called GPFS. Now it's called IBM Spectrum Scale, if you've heard that. So this is the file system underneath Mira. Um, it's also the project file system at NERSC for those NERSC users out there who are familiar with the, our storage hierarchy. GPFS, or Spectrum Scale, is, is quite different from Luster. I mean, it, it is still a parallel file system, so you still have data that's sprayed out over, over a bunch of LUNs or hard drives and flash. Um, and instead of OSSs, they have NSD servers. Um, but the way that you can connect NSD servers and the LUNs that actually store your data is, is uh, a lot more flexible. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ways you can actually plumb one of these things together. But one of the defining features of uh, IBM Spectrum Scale is that you can interleave metadata and data. So if the system is designed in a certain way, uh, your metadata performance can scale with your data performance, which is distinctly different from Luster, where you, you separate them and you have metadata servers that are of a certain capability and data servers of a different capability. Uh, in the GPFS case, one server can do double duty if so designed. Uh, another key feature of Spectrum Scale is that you don't have the option to choose what the striping of your file is. This is very different from Luster, where it is up to you to decide that. Instead, your file is broken up into stripes, and it's just sprayed across every disk available. Um, so this has performance implications in that you're, you're, you're touching a lot of hard drives, which is good for parallel performance. But if one of those hard drives is slow for some reason, it's unhealthy, or it's um, you know, being used by another user, that drags down the performance of, of your, your IO, and you can do nothing about it. Um, but like Luster, it's really designed to handle large megabytes or larger sized IOs, uh, and that's really what you want to target with it. Um, so I would imagine if any of you came from the sort of background that I did, working at a small lab scale cluster first, uh, you've encountered NFS. And a question that I had very early on is, you know, what's the point of Luster? What's wrong with the NFS that I've got now? I, mean, I don't see an issue. What's different about NFS? Um, and it took me a couple years to appreciate really what the difference between a, a true parallel file system and something like clustered NFS uh, and, and NetApp and Isilon are examples of, of such things. 
And the key difference really is, is that when, you're, when your compute node is retrieving data from an NFS server, there is one single path that your, your compute node is talking to. So your file is owned by one server, and you're talking to that one server, and you're getting your data off of that one server, and that's one data path. So there's really no parallelism in there. Clustered NFS does let you um, have multiple clients access uh, the same file through different servers. But what's really happening behind the scenes is that if you're accessing a, a file, say from this compute node at the bottom here to this NFS server, but the file actually lives on this NFS server, this NFS server will pull the data from where it actually lives all over the backend storage fabric and then pass it on to you. So there's multiple hops involved and you're not really gaining any performance. You're losing performance, but you're gaining the convenience of it. Um, and this is really popular mostly because of convenience. So everyone with a Mac laptop has an NFS client available to you, so you could mount an NFS server. That is certainly not true of Lustre. Lustre just won't work on your laptop. Hate to say it. You would have to export it through NFS or something like that to even have a hope of accessing your data. But at large, still, large scales on supercomputers, the benefits of a true parallel file system far outweigh the convenience of doing cluster NFS. So very few people actually do this for anything more than just like home directories. So now descending the stack even further, we've talked about parallel file system implementations. Let's talk about the hardware that is used to build up these parallel file systems. So these are just a few pictures, again, from NURSE that I took in our data center. Uh, the one on the left here is what one of those OSTs looks like. Um, this is actually the new community file system that we're standing up right now. So this is a 75 petabyte file system that's on our floor. We're configuring it now. It should be available soon. Um, but what it is is you pull out one of these shelves and this thing is just 106 drive bays. Each one of these purple tabs has a 14 terabyte hard drive underneath it. So you can do the math. Each one of these is 106 times 14. And then in this one rack, there's four of these shelves on the top half, four more on the bottom half, so you can do the multiplication. There's two servers in the middle, which are the NSD servers. And then we've got, I think, eight racks of these. Uh, so it's a lot of capacity. Um, and then on the right is the brains of the Cory Scratch file system. This is our Mellanox InfiniBand switch. So every bit you've ever read or written to the file system attached to Cori has gone through this. And this is what makes the Lustre file system cluster uh, actually work. Yes? How do you decide like, the right number of like, capacity versus number of individual drives? So it is. So these are 14 terabyte drives. Um, and I showed C Scratch, which is four terabyte drives. And that's a great segue to this slide because, um, so this is a hard drive, which is the basis of the vast majority of parallel file systems and all file systems out there. Um, and I would imagine many of you have seen a picture of hard drives, the inside of them, but this thing's sitting on my desk. So again, if you come visit me at Nurse, you can pick this up and play with it. Um, so the way hard drives work is that there's this big uh, glass or aluminum platter that just spins around really fast at a constant speed, either 7,200 RPM or 10,000 RPM. And then there's this, uh, this actuated uh, arm that just swings in and out. And at the very tip of that arm is a read and write head. And this is how it picks up uh, magnetic ones and zeros off the surface of this hard drive. And because this platters spin at a constant speed, they've, they've really always spun at 7.2K RPM um, or 10K for years and years. The only way to get more performance out of a hard drive is either to make the bits smaller so that in one rotation at you know, 7,200 RPM, you're covering more bits or to add more platters. And there's only one motor that spins this thing around. So you know, as you're stacking platters, you're adding more read heads. There's only one actuator that moves that arm back and forth. Um, so what it amounts to is that the performance of a single hard drive has not been going up appreciably. So to answer your question, uh, the decision capacity versus performance is really how, many, how much performance you want is dependent on how many spindles you want. So if you want a lot of performance, but you don't want to pay for a lot of capacity, you buy a lower, lower capacity hard drive, but more of them, so you get more spindles and more aggregate bandwidth. But because of the mechanical nature of this, you can imagine that it's, it's good at certain things. So if you leave your arms in a certain position and just let that drive spin and just slowly move it in and out, you can read a huge amount of data that's all sequentially coded pretty quickly. But if you have data scattered all over the surface of this disk and that arm is flapping around, um, that's going to be pretty poor because every time you miss reading at bit, that whole platter has to circle back around. 
uh, before you have a second chance at reading it. So what this means is that this, the streaming sequential bandwidth of hard drives is, is not bad, but if you want to do random access to one, the performance is, is notoriously terrible, and it's not getting better. So to address this, or perhaps fortuitously, um, flash solid state media has become pretty commonplace nowadays. Uh, this is, it looks like a hard drive to the computer, but it just performs a lot faster. And there's no moving parts in this. Instead, it's a bunch of transistors, it's a bunch of cells. Um, and one SSD that you would buy, whether it be for your data center or for your laptop, is composed of a bunch of different NAND chips. And each one of these chips has multiple NAND dies in it. Each die has a number of blocks in it, and each block has a bunch of pages. So you can imagine that one SSD has an extreme amount of parallelism in it because you've got chips and dies and planes and blocks and, and so forth. The trick with these is that when you want to write something, you must write a whole page at a time. So you must write four kilobytes at a time. Um, but when you want to rewrite something, you can't modify a page in place. You have to delete it, and you have to delete all of its friends around it. So as a result, SSDs are, the write performance is a little tricky because you always have to find uh, either an empty page that you can write to, or you have to find, if you don't have those, you have to find a block that has mostly empty pages. Um, then erase, you have to move the valid pages off to another block, erase that block, and then you can start writing uh, a lot of pages to that block again. And there's a thing in this, in every SSD called the flash translation layer, the FTL, and its job is to do this garbage collection. It's constantly moving pages out of the way so that it can erase an entire block so that you can write new data to it. As a result, this garbage collection process is reading pages off of the device and just rewriting them, and that bandwidth is the same bandwidth that you would get by writing data to an SSD. So as a result, uh, if you have a lot of garbage collection happening because you're writing kind of all over the place and you're constantly having to repack pages and blocks, um, your bandwidth will suffer, your performance will suffer because you're competing with the process of garbage collection. Um, so what this means in terms of performance is when you're using an SSD, it still helps to have nice, big streaming I.O. Um, they are capable of delivering random uh, I.O. performance far superior to hard drives, um, but it's not perfect, and the more you do that, the more you can degrade the performance of the SSD until garbage collection just comes through and picks everything up and then cleans it up for you. And this is a very dynamic process that's always going on in the background. Um, also, as a result of the fact that there's so many parallel chips and dies and planes and things like that, in order to get the full performance out of a single SSD, you wind up having to issue a ton of parallel I.O. requests at the same time. And that way, they're using the full internal parallelism of an SSD to get that full performance out for you. Yes? So that is, that is defragging. Um, that is not, so you're, you're right, but it's the, the reason you would have to do that is slightly different. Um, but yes, that's a very astute observation. So the process of defragging is taking blocks that are scattered all over and making them sequential so that you know, one rotation you can read all of those blocks at once. Um, that's different from garbage collection in SSD because you, in an SSD, you must move those pages. It's not a matter of performance. It's a matter of if you can actually write another page um, or delete a block. Um, so it's, one is optional and it makes things a little better. One is absolutely required and you have no control over it because it's happening whether you want it to or not. Um, so then uh, you have all these individual hard drives and SSDs, and if any one of them goes, you lose all the data on it. And because of the way they're built, uh, you know, if one component, one chip, or one platter, or the actuator arm goes, even though your data might physically still be there, you can no longer get it, so it's a loss. So what you do to protect your data against uh, a single drive failure or multiple drive failures is RAID. I would imagine most of you have heard of RAID. Um, the reason I bring it up here is because RAID exists in every file system that has any kind of guarantee of your data not being lost, and it has pretty severe performance implications if you don't know how it works. Um, so this is a diagram of mathematically what's happening in RAID, but essentially uh, every time you write a big piece of data, that data is broken up into pieces. Each piece of equal size is stored on a different physical drive. And then parity is calculated from that full stripe, and that parity is also written to yet more drives. And this is important because, one, the parity is what lets you recover data in the case of a single drive failure or multiple drive failure, depending on how much parity you have. Um, 
but also it means that when you do something like write uh, a full stripe and then you want to modify and just flip one bit that's within that stripe, in order to maintain parity, you must read back the, the block that's containing that bit you want to flip. You must flip that bit. You must read back the parity that you calculated and then you must calculate the new parity based on that bit that you flipped. And then you have to write back down the entire block that you changed, as well as all of the parity that was also updated. So a single bit flip can result in multiple hundreds of kilobytes having to be read and written to your rate array. So what you think might be a pretty innocent procedure of you know, changing just a few things here and there in a RAID scheme will result in a tremendous amount of I.O. That, that you're not aware of. And this is particularly relevant if you're doing a lot of small I.O. operations, as you can imagine. IOPS heavy workloads, um, because you're doing this read, modify, write that's really generating a lot of churn in the, the RAID system. And RAID is also implicated in a lot of mysterious performance problems in practice. So when a drive does fail, it needs to be rebuilt when a replacement is put in. That rebuild process requires reading every single surviving drive. And while that's happening, your, your application can't also read at full performance. It's sharing that bandwidth with the rebuild. So a rebuilt array, an array that's under rebuild will have significantly degraded performance. And there's really no way for you as a user to tell that a rebuild is happening on one of the, say, Luster OSSs that you're using. So performance is mysteriously degraded. You have no idea why. It might be because a RAID rebuild is happening. Um, also, very reliable file systems will check parity every time you read it so that you're never given corrupt data. But of course, there's a cost associated with this. And every read would require that you also read the parity and, and make sure it's all good. Uh, as kind of a middle ground to this, what we do at NERSC and many Lustre file systems do um, is instead of doing a parity check on every single read, at some point every single month, we just read every single drive and check parity for everything. And this process can take a few days and while that's happening, you can't get the highest performance from the file system because you're competing with this parity checking procedure. So we only have three minutes left. Um, I was going to talk about burst buffers, but burst buffers are a, you know, a way of, of kind of compromising and balancing the fact that hard drives are really slow, flash is really fast, but hard drives are cheap on a per gigabyte basis and flash is, tends to be very expensive on a per gigabyte basis. So burst buffers are not in every supercomputer you will use. In fact, they are in really only the largest ones that have the most demanding I.O. needs. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, if we have time at the end, maybe I'll revisit this. Um, but instead, I'll take the next two minutes and 30 seconds to answer any questions that are outstanding about hardware. Yes? Um, Why are we stuck with disk drives, I guess? And like, there are like other types of memory, and like we can't use those. Is it because of the bit flip thing? Like they're like less reliable on long time scales. So the so the way memory works is that it, it's DRAM, it's dynamic RAM, which means that if you lose power, everything in RAM goes away, right? This is why rebooting a computer fixes all your problems because you're deleting everything that describes the buggy state that your system is in. So that's that's a major issue. Is that you know your data disappears if you lose power unexpectedly. Um, but really, you know, for persistent memory, which is now emerging in flash and hard drives, it's a dollars per bit measurement. So I will say, uh, just broadly speaking, um, so the Cori file system, which is shown here, uh, well, it was shown before, is 30 petabytes of luster. This is uh, a few burst buffer nodes. So the Cori has a 1.8 petabyte burst buffer. So 1.8 petabytes versus 30 petabytes cost the same amount of money when we procured the system. So you really don't want to spend your entire storage budget on Flash because there will be so little of it, um, well, historically, that it, you would constantly be churning. You would have to delete your data constantly, and it's a major inconvenience for users. So it's, it's a cost per bit thing. Yes? Are burst buffers like the, so we're, we're getting these new exotic processors on our supercomputers. Are burst buffers like the next exotic thing in memory, or is memory pretty static in terms of development? So, so burst buffers, uh, to be pedantic, they're not memory. It, it is very much storage. Um, it's just really fast storage. And really what a burst buffer is, it's just, um, so this is where we depart from, from hardware. And it, burst buffer is really a software concept. So it's a way of taking a small amount of flash and equally sharing it to the people who need it. Um, 
So SSDs have been around for a while, uh, and a burst buffer is just bridging that usability gap and providing a flash-based parallel file system uh, to people who need it and not to people who don't so that they can get performance kind of on demand and as they need it, and then it's immediately freed up so that the next user can use it. So you're not parking your data on Flash forever and preventing everyone else from using it. So it's very much a software concept, and you know, like everything software, it's, it's being refined and becoming easier to use and, and more transparent to users. All right. So like I said, we can revisit this um, if there's interest. It is just kind of a more of a niche thing. And to be honest, um, we recently at NERSC announced our next generation system. So Cori uh, is our previous generation. And in 2021, we will, or 2020, I should say, we're delivering Perlmutter. And the thing that I like about Perlmutter, I'm in charge of the file system, is that there's no more burst buffer. We, just, we could afford all flash. So there's no hard drives in it. So there's no burst buffers, no hard drives. I'm disinclined to talk about the virtues of a burst buffer because in a couple of years, we won't have one. So you should all come and use our system because it's a lot easier. We just have one giant flash-based file system. Um, right, but like I said, we can revisit this as time permits. Mm -hmm.